Hey, everybody. It is How To Tuesday. It is also fall, and fall means hunting season. One of my friends in Florida, Ryan Nitz, does a tremendous amount of hunting, and he hunts public land, which is not easy to do. And so if you are someone who is looking to get into hunting and you don't have any private land to hunt, if you are someone who wants to get better at public land hunting, you're going to want to pay attention to this particular podcast because Ryan is going to unload a lot of knowledge about public land hunting in Florida. So stick around for that. We're going to thank our sponsors really quickly. Uh, Today we have Empire Boat Covers. Go to empirecovers.com forward slash TRP. You can get 15% off your order plus free shipping. You can get a cover for about anything there, your grill or your boat, anything you want. Barracuda Tackle is a place where you can go and get fantastic cast nets. You can even get a custom cast net of any color you want. BarracudaTackle.com. Boat Hammock Stand is another of our sponsors today. You can go there and you can buy a stand that goes in your rod holder and allows you to hang a hammock in your boat. Very cool product. BoatHammockStand.com. And you can also go and check out Fishing Points app. This is a great app. We've talked about journaling and logging a lot of your information. This allows you to do it with just the picture of your fish. It does it automatically for you. It's very cool. Check out Fishing Points app in the app store of your choice. And we are ready to go for today's show. I've got Ryan Nitz here. He is a very, very accomplished snook fisherman, of course. But a lot of people don't know that Ryan Nitz is also a very, very accomplished hunter. He's a great deer hunter, turkey hunter, and he does most of it on public land. That's what we're going to talk about today. Ryan, what's going on? I'm glad you're here. Thanks for helping us out with this one. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about public land hunting. What's going on? It's good to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Yeah. Well, it's not been a couple of years for me because I follow you on Instagram and I watch all the stuff that you're catching and killing and you're doing awesome, man. You just got back from your elk hunt. Is that correct? I just got back from Colorado, 28 hour drive. Uh, funny enough, I got here at three 30 in the morning and I was back out in the woods at five 30 hunting public land down here again. Dang, you're an animal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, one of the things that, uh, we've had a lot of questions about, and I know you get a lot of questions too, is how do you get started public land hunting? And let's talk about it, especially in Florida. Tell, let's, let's go from A to Z, Ryan, if you don't mind sharing some of your knowledge with, with our listeners, that would be fantastic. Um, just kind of A to Z, what, what you tell people when they ask about getting into hunting in Florida? Absolutely. I mean, I get a lot of people asking me about fishing and obviously that's way easier to just go buy a fishing pole and walk down to the water and start fishing. Um, hunting, if you've never grown up or had someone to show you, it can be very, very hard to get into it. Um, and basically it starts off with getting your hunter safety course. You, you cannot you cannot buy a permit or have a license until you go and take this safety course. And that is offered through my FWC, Florida Wildlife Conservation Commission. And it's a, it's a simple course. It's a two hour course or a two day course, excuse me. And it might be different now with you know all the COVID, you, it might be online or whatnot, but anyways, super simple course. And that's going to run you through the basics. You know, um, once you have that, you can start applying to where you want to hunt. There's, I think 6 million acres of public land in Florida no matter what county you're in, there's going to be some land to go hunt somewhere. And primarily that's going to be deer, turkey, hogs, ducks, alligators. Um, some people, you know, are more into wing shooting. We have doves, quails. Um, so first things first, you're going to get your hunter safety course. After that, um, you can go and you can, uh, there's, so the main thing is, and it gets super tricky. Um, every piece of land in Florida has their own rules and regulations. The, the, the zone, uh, Florida is broke up into four different zones. There's zone A, B, C, and D. And each zone has different dates on when your season starts. So you got to pay attention to that. Again, this is all on my FWC. So, you know, whatever you're confused about, you go there and they can tell you everything I'm about to tell you. Um, Some WMA, so for instance, where I live, I live here in Jupiter, Florida. There is three huge WMAs. And when I say WMA, I mean wildlife management area. Um, There's three of them here. There's Corbett, there's Hungry Land, and there's Alapata. Those three I hunt a lot because they're right here next to my house. Well, just for example, Corbett is 60,000 acres. 
Corbett, you don't need a quota. A quota is a limited entry, um, meaning anybody can go in there as soon as it opens. When it opens opening day, there is going to be hundreds of people flooding into Corbett to go hunting. Well, across the street from that is Hungry Land. Now, Hungry Land is only 12,000 acres and you need a quota to go in there, meaning you have to apply before the season starts on my FWC. And if you get drawn, you can go hunt that. Um, they only let, you know, 30 to 50 people in there on any given week. So you got to know, you know, if, if you're going to this place, okay, I don't need a quota. I can go in there. If I'm going here, you better have a quota. Okay. Um, so let me ask you this real question, this question real quick. When you, when you apply for that quota, you're doing all that through F, my FWC yes. to apply for it. And then when would you get your quota? When would they alert you or tell you that notify you that you, you are eligible to hunt in this area? So they start, I think May is when you can start applying. Um, our bow, so bow season is what opens first. Primarily that's what opens always first in the country is bow season archery. Um, so you would apply in May and that goes pretty much all through the summer and they'll let you know, they send you emails and alerts that if you get drawn, um, and they would let you know probably about six to seven weeks before the hunt, probably sometime in July. Um, that gives you plenty of time to go out there and set cameras. Um, now on public land, you are not allowed to bait. There's no baiting allowed. You can go put out cameras, but that's about it. Um, so, you know, it's not like private land hunting and you got to understand as a public land hunter, it's not going to be like that. You know, if you talk to a private land hunter and they're, they're going to tell you, Oh, I saw 20 deer today and they were all over the place. Don't expect that on public land. That's not how it goes. Um, you, uh, so basically you get your quota and you're going to have a couple weeks to go scouting. Scouting is huge. Scouting is everything. It's just like fishing. It's, uh, the more time you spend out there, you're going to know. And when it comes to scouting, no one scouts more than I do. I am out there all day, all, all week long. I'm putting in miles. I'm talking minimal of eight miles. Now, a lot of people are not going to be able to do that. Um, but the more you scout, the better. And I've had lately had an obsession with trail cameras. I can't stop buying them. And I can say, I, that's the photographer in me. You know, I don't even do it just for the hunting aspect. I like setting them up on like, you know, cool logs and crossings and whatnot. So I like learning a lot more beyond just killing them. Um, so yeah, quota, quotas are the key. If you want to kill, if you want to have a, as good as chance of killing a deer in Florida, you're going to want to get on a quota hunt. Like I said, you know, um, a lot of people hunt around here and it's very discouraging when you get to your stand and there's, you know, three people walking around with flashlights. Um, and that happens a lot. And that's another thing, you know, I'll maybe talk about a little later is the etiquette. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's do that. You know, there's sure. people, etiquette is probably the biggest thing out of them all. And, you know, throughout the years, you know, I'm 29 now. Um, when I first started hunting when I was 18, you know, I didn't really know what was going on. I was just rummaging through the woods, you know, a little banshee. Um, so, I mean, since we're talking about it, let's talk about it. Um, if you're a first time hunter, everybody hunts different. There's people who are going to want to walk around and walk, walk and stalk. That's where you walk really slow and you look for animals and then you proceed to figure out how you're going to get a shot on one. And then there's a lot of people who like to just find a good tree and whether they set up a ladder stand or a climbing stand, they'll sit all day in a climber. Well, if you're a walk and stalk hunter and you're walking down a trail and a hundred yards in front of you, you see a guy sitting in a tree, turn around. Don't keep walking in front of them. I don't care if, if you know there's deer up in front of them. Just be curious. There's 60,000 acres of land. Turn around, let the guy have it. Um, another thing, um, vice versa, or, or uh, let me say this. A lot of people, before their hunt, they put ribbons out. They'll put these ribbons out marking, you know, these plastic ribbons. Don't do that. Don't be that guy. Because I've seen so many ribbons out there that are left out there. And, uh, it's public land again, don't just because you have your ribbons here, doesn't mean it's your property anymore. Um, so don't do that. Don't be that guy. Um, when you're hunting, when you're pulling into a spot in the morning, um, a lot of places there'll have, you have to have a designated parking spot. If you pull up there, let me just tell you this. When I pull up to my spot that I've been scouting all month and I get there and there's already five trucks there, I'm not going to go there. I'm going somewhere else. And I can't tell you how many times I've killed deer 
saying, all right, you know what? There's already enough people here. I'm going to go to this spot. I go to this spot. There's no trucks there. I've never even scouted it, but I walk 200 yards in and I kill a deer. That happens all the time. So don't get discouraged and don't go in there picking a fight with somebody, you know, cause let's face it, you know, these, some of these guys out there have guns and you don't, you don't know, you know, there's people out there. You just don't know. So no deer is worth fighting over, right? Just go somewhere else. That's, that's a big thing. Um, bow season, let's start off with bow season, bow season. You don't need hunter's orange. So don't need hunter's orange. Bow season is very, bow hunting is very tough. If you're a first time hunter, don't just go buy a bow and go out there. There's a lot of preparation in bow hunting. If you're going to be serious about bow hunting, get a bow way months in advance and shoot it every single day. Um, and when it comes down to crunch time, you're not going to want to shoot a deer in the back of the back and trail them for three days and you're never going to find them. So when right. it comes crunch time, if you're going to be a bow hunter, that's more preparation than anything. You need to shoot, 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 shoot. You need to figure out where that arrow is going to be and whatnot, or you're just wasting your time. Let me, let me ask you a little bit about your opinion about that. How, how dialed do you need to be to have success in Florida bow hunting like, do you need to have your ranges at 30, 40, 50, or 50, 60, 70? And could you, do you need to be able to put six arrows in a, in a, you know, a little two inch, uh, uh, target or like, what's your, what's your kind of baseline minimum baseline that you feel like you would be able to, uh, ethically and, and, uh, effectively hunt with a bow? For me, 65 yards is my maximum. Um, again, that's going to be different for everyone else. And it's going to be different for every state that you hunt. Florida is really thick. So there's a lot of areas when you're bow hunting that you can get real tight in with them and your shot's going to be 20 yards. That's very common. Um, it depends on your bow. Now with me, bow hunting is my passion. So, you know, dang right. I'm going to have the nicest of the nice. And I have, I have a Matthews VXR. It's one of their newest bows. It's one of their baddest bows they've ever made. So of course, you know, shooting 65 yards is no problem with a bow like that. Not everyone has the luxury of buying, you know, a top end bow. And so it's really whatever you're comfortable with. Um, an average bow, you can go, you know, you can buy a used bow online for anywhere from three to $600 and that'll get the job done. Um, minimal of 40 pound draw legal in Florida has to have at least 40 pounds of draw to legally hunt with. And most, most, you know, young females can pull back a 40 pound bow. So mm -hmm. don't be worried about that. Um, so 20 yards, my pins on my bow are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Um, and I can shoot at 60 yards. I can hit a pie plate no every time. And that's what you want to do. So if you can't, if you can't hit, basically, if you can't hit a pie plate, then you're not doing it right. Okay. It needs to be within even smaller of a ply plate, but okay. you know, your grouping, your groupings need to be within two to six inches of each other. Nothing farther out of that, okay. or you need to just keep shooting. So with seasons after, after bow season, you go into muzzleloader. Um, muzzleloader is the, probably the best time of the year to be in the woods. Um, you're the first gun in the woods. Um, now muzzleloaders, again, there's a lot of rules with them. It's, it's 45 caliber or bigger. You got to have, um, and with a muzzle loader, you're, you're literally, it's like old time you're putting in the powder and that muzzle loader, um, it's one shot. You get one shot and that's it after muzzle loader general gun. And that's when you got to be careful again. Now, if you have a gun in your hands, you better have orange on, you have to have 500 square inches of orange, which means a vest and a hat. So make sure you have that because again, like I said, there's people out there and you'll hear these horror stories every now and then of of, you know, somebody walking through the woods and some people it's rare, but some people sometimes don't look at their target before they're shooting. And that's huge. If you're going to become a hunter, you got to make sure you know what you're shooting. And that brings me in. My next thing is, is legal deer. Um, legal deer is a big thing to me now. And now when I was young, you know, when you're a first time hunter, if it's Brown, it's down. If it has eyes, it dies. Well, 10 years ago, when I first started hunting Florida, there was no bag limit. There was no reporting system. There was basically, you could kill a deer every day of season until the season ends. Well, up until about four or five years ago, um, 
the FWC has implemented antler restriction rules. First, they started off with two points on one side, um, and then they went to three points on one side, which is what it is now. So meaning it has to have three points, meaning, let me see here. I have some right here. Here's a deer skull. Now, this is your main beam. Your long one is your main beam. Now with, with the rule, it's three on one side or a 10 inch main beam. This is your main beam. This is probably a 16 inch main beam. So obviously you could shoot it and it also has points one. No. Okay. So here's another big tricky thing. You see this right here? That this is not, oh, this is not over an inch. Okay. If it's not over an inch, it's not considered a point. Now the old timers will tell you if you can hang a ring on it, it's a point. But by rules of FWC is it has to be an inch. So to be honest with you, I would not count that as a point. You got to be careful. But this right here is a point. This right here is a point. And then you got your brow time. So that would be three. One, two, three. That nice. would be a legal deer. But what you see a lot of time in Florida is um, you're going to get a lot of young deer come. You know, barely, they're probably nine inch horns and they've got just a four. And you see a lot of people killing those deer. And they're like, oh, I thought it was 10 inches. So I don't like the 10 inch rule. I think I wish they would do away with it because so many people are like, oh, I thought it was 10 inches. How am I supposed to know? Well, when in doubt, let them go. Right. Um, there are certain days you can shoot does, you know, female deer. And every WMA, again, is different. This WMA over here, they'll let you shoot does. Well, the WMA across the street doesn't let you shoot does. And you've got to be very, you got to know what you're, you're doing. Again, on my FWC, you can look up every specific WMA and they're going to outline every single rule for that particular WMA. Um, again, no feeding. Never, ever put corn or anything down on public land. That is very illegal. And they FWC doesn't play when it comes to it. If you get caught doing some things, they could take your hunting license away for three to five years or indefinitely. Right. So it's nothing, nothing to... Uh, risk. So Ryan, um, um, just to be clear, are there places in Florida on private land that you can feed? Is there a difference in the rule there or can you just not feed in Florida yes. whatsoever? Private land you can feed. Okay. Um, now with private land, you have to have a feeder established. I believe it's six months prior to season. So you just can't go out there a day before and drop a hundred pounds of corn and hunt it. It's got to be established um, a long time before that, but yes, you can feed on private land. Okay. So for, um, for the purposes of this on public land, there's no feeding of any kind whatsoever. Never, no exception, no feeding. Never. Okay. Never. Um, and so another thing again with the reporting the game, uh, so they've gotten very strict. This is the first year now where, when you kill a deer, before you even move that deer, you have to report it. Um, meaning now most, most of us are going to be using our phones and you just go on the app. There's an app. You say, okay, I shot an eight point right here at this WMA, log it in. It's in the system. Um, for the old timers out there who aren't doing that, you can print out a form and you fill it out right away when you kill it and you have to put it, I'm not sure how it is. I think you have to rubber band it to the antler or something. And then you have 24 hours to call it in. So make sure that you do that. Cause I've already seen a couple of people this year, they're posting pictures of the deer and they haven't reported it. And then a week later there's, they're coming online saying, man, make sure you report your deer. I forgot to report it. There's FWC out there constantly monitoring that they're going to, they're going to be online. They're going to be checking. If they, if you post a picture of your deer, somebody's going to be checking that. So make sure you log it this year. They've implemented five deer a year in Florida. You're allowed five deer no more than two of those can be females. So you can either shoot five bucks and no females, or you can shoot three bucks and two does. So, or you can shoot four bucks and one doe. You just can't shoot more than two does. Right. Um, so you're, you're, you're limited now. You got five deer a year, which is more than enough to feed any family. I mean, when you properly clean and skin out a deer, I mean, that's more meat than you can handle. So I'm all about the limits and just, you know, the few years since they've started, I've seen a dramatic increase in bigger bucks being shot and more deer, you know, around. So I think they're doing a good job with that. Uh, supplies. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Basics are going to first, first thing is all is a thermocell. 
thermosel, thermosel, <laughs> thermosel, or you will die out there. Um, you're going to want a thermosel. The mosquitoes are terrible. Turn that sucker on before you even start walking out there. You want that thing red hot by the time you get in your tree. Some people even use two of them. Um, a knife. I use a Havilon knife just because, I mean, the blades are cheap. And as soon as you put a, a new blade on there, you can carve a deer up in a matter of no time. It's so much easier carving out a deer with a sharp knife than a dull knife. Don't do it. So, um, headlight. Um, you're going to want, you want to figure out how you're going to hunt. Tree stand, climber, walking stock. I think if you're a beginner, the best type is going to be a ladder stand. Get a ladder stand, they're $100 to $200, and that's basically a 15-foot ladder with a seat on it. Uh, get you a safety harness. That's going to be a full-body harness that you're going to want to be in, and it clips to the top of the tree. God forbid you fall out. You're going to want that safety harness on. People die every year because they fall out of their tree stand. And I don't care how good you are. I don't care how young and spry you are. Things happen up there. If sure. you stand up and you got a big, giant buck coming at you, <laughs> You're going to, you might lose your feeding. It happens. You, everything goes out the window when you got right. a big buck coming down the lane. So be safe, wear a, wear a safety harness. Um, those are the basics. You know, you're going to want your thermosel, your knife, your, your flashlight. When you're walking in, in the morning, um, get a light that has a red, a red light. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's better. You know, you don't want to go in there with a giant white light. People are going to be mad. You know, your spot light in the woods, the deer see that they, I don't think they see the red. I've never really had a problem with the red. So try and get one that has that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, trail cameras are big. Um, I'm a big fan of the Browning trail cameras they are about a hundred dollars and they're going to be, they're going to tell you a lot what's going on in the woods. Um, you can save a lot of headache. So, so you have a couple of different trail camera options. Um, you have types of cameras that you have to go out there and get the card. And then you have other cameras that you have hooked up to a cellular network or whatever, and you can get the, get the pictures delivered to your phone. Um, which do you prefer? And it is one worth, <laughs> worth the cost? Uh, once you get a cell phone camera, it's like Christmas every morning. <laughs> I mean, I wake up at four 30 in the morning and that's the first thing I'm checking is my cell phone cameras. Um, and that's, you know, something new this year that's, you know, it's blowing up is cell phone cameras. Um, there's spy point, there's mole tree, there's Spartan. Um, they're very new in the game with the cell phone cameras. So there's still a lot of hiccups with all the companies. I don't think there's really not one company out there that's flawless yet, but they all do a pretty good job. Um, you're not going to get the quality out of those as like a, one that you just kind of leave with an SD card. Those Brownings that I was telling you, super HD video. Um, and I'm, I think with those cell phone cameras, you can get it, but you got to pay extra money for them to transmit high quality videos and whatnot. But, but the cell phone camera is great, more or less so for a private land hunter than it is a public land hunter. Again, with the public land hunting, um, a lot of times with, especially with the quota hunts, you only have three days when you get a quota, it's most of the time, it's only a three or four day hunt. So your time's limited. Yeah. Um, the cell phone cameras are great for people who have private land because you could be sitting on your couch and, Oh, it, it went off. I'm going to go out there. Right. Um, that's not as easy with the public land. Um, but again, it is very fun. The, the best thing about a cell phone camera is you're not going out there consistently to check it. That's huge. These mature whitetails are smart. If you go out there and you're checking your camera once a week, that deer knows. That deer's been living there for four or five years. And when you come walking through there, he smells that. If you haven't been there for six months and now you're walking through there every week, that deer smells that trail. I have, I have tons of videos of me setting up a trail camera for the first time ever, a buck coming in, hitting that scent and going, whoa, and taking off and getting out of there. And you won't see him again for two weeks. Well, with the cell phone cameras, I'm noticing now that I'm leaving them out there for months at a time almost. And you'll see the first week you won't really get anything. And then after that, they just start coming through. And uh, it's just, that's what, that's, I think the most valuable thing of a cell phone camera is you're getting real time data right away. You're not having to drive out there. You're saving gas money by going out there. You know, a lot of times the woods are, you know, isn't in your backyard. It's probably an hour drive, an hour walk or whatever it is. So the cell phone cameras are, are saving you a lot of time and effort. Um, so I like them both. It's whatever you can afford. 
Again, the cell phone cameras range anywhere from a hundred to $400. And with me on public land, I'm not putting a $400 camera out in the woods. Right. There are people out there who will chop down a tree to steal your camera. I've seen it. So you can put a lock on it. Um, that's that, you know, pretty much keeps an honest man out. Um, just a $20 Python lock. You put it in there. That'll save you most of the time, but don't go out there and put a $400 camera. And when it gets stolen, be surprised. It, it can happen. Right. Right. Man. Good tips, man. What about, um, what about the scent? We talked, we briefly talked about scent, but for, for hunters that are just getting started, they may not realize how important, you know, disguising your scent ways that you can do that. Uh, let's cover that real quick. Well, scent control in Florida is pretty much non-existent. <laughs> um, you know, you can, you can shower in non-smelling shampoo. You can, you can, uh, spray down, you can wash your clothes in non-scent detergent, but two minutes out there in the woods, you're soaked in sweat. So play the wind. The wind is it. That's all you can do. And I don't care. Anybody can tell me different. You know, they make these things called ozonics where, you know, they sucks in your air and whatever. That's to me, it's all a gimmick. The wind is, that's it is your wind. Um, now not to say I don't still spray down and all that, you know, I'm trying to get the best advantage I can, but you got to play the win. When you, when you find an area that you want to hunt, um, one of my favorite apps is windy W I N D Y windy. And that's going to show you the winds for what it's doing. Um, a lot of times I won't hunt a, a particular spot until the wind is right because you're pissing in the wind, the winds in your face, you're good. If you're hunting an area and the wind's at your back and it's blowing your wind right into where you're thinking that deer is going to come from, you're never going to see them. You're never even going to see them. They're going to smell you so far away. You're not even going to know they're there. Um, so scent control, really play the wind. Um, <laughs> I'm out there usually a lot of times just in my, my board shorts. <laughs> That's it. I got nothing on but board shorts and I don't really recommend barefoot, but a lot of people who know me is I'm the barefoot bandit around here. It's just super stealthy. Yeah. Um, I'm a walk and stalk hunter. So I, I, I don't, I encourage it and I don't encourage it. If you're not a walk and stalk hunter, don't try and be one. It takes a lot of stealth and patience. You know, you just don't walk around. Oh, da, 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 da. oh there's a deer and fling an arrow. It doesn't work like that. You got to literally walk inches by inches and you got to take serious note of your surrounding to be a, a successful walk and stalk hunter. It's not for everybody. So you can try it. If you're not seeing anything, don't be surprised. They're probably seeing you a long ways ahead before they see you. Got you it. see them. Got it. Um, boots. Boots are tough. Um, you know, especially with all this rain lately, a lot of areas that you're hunting are going to be probably over your boot. Um, and that's another thing why I go barefoot. But what you can wear is some water shoes. Um, you can wear water shoes and you can wear some maybe snake, like, uh, I don't know if they're called like gaiters or whatever. They're kind of like a shin pad. Right. Um, there's a lot of snakes around. I see them all the time. I don't wear any of that. Again, I don't recommend that. I'm very, I'm so alert with my surroundings. I mean, I, I'm out in the woods every day. I see snakes all the time. They're out there. Just got to be careful. You got to watch it out. Um, alligators are a big thing. Um, especially, you know, I've seen, I've seen eight foot alligators in a, in a tiny little hole that you would never think an eight foot alligator is in. So you gotta be aware of that. Um, Another big thing is ticks. Ticks are huge. There's ticks all over the place. Um, a thermocell is not going to help you on ticks. You're going to want permethrin. Um, Sawyer is a company that makes that permethrin. You can, you can coat your clothes in it um, a day before the hunt and it'll dry. And as soon as the tick gets on you, it'll die. That permethrin works really great. Um, what about when you're, when you're out there in your board shorts? What, how are you watching out for ticks like that? You just get them. It's the name of the, you just get them. <laughs> you just get them. You got to watch it. I mean, once you get a couple of ticks, you'll know, like, you know, you'll feel it. But, uh, luckily we don't have as many ticks down here. We get big ticks down here in South Florida. So you feel them. Mm. Um, when you go to North Florida, there's seed ticks up there and those are nasty. I mean, you'll be, by the time you notice it, you'll have hundreds of them on you. Yeah. Um, so North Florida is a little more sketchy when it comes to ticks down here. You'll get maybe one or two on you every now and then. And that's mostly because I'm walking through the grass like miles. When you're when you're in the tree stand, you don't really have to worry about that. You're pretty much you're going to your spot. You get up in your tree stand. You're sitting up there. Me, I'm like a, a deer. I'm walking through the woods. 
picking up everything. Yeah. So you just got to check yourself after every hunt. That's what I do. Gotcha. Just check again. They like, you know, they like that. They like areas that you don't want them to be in. Let's put it that way. So <laughs> check, check those first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, so man, that's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, as far as like looking at these, these, uh, areas that you're thinking about hunting, whether that's a, uh, e either type hunt that we discussed, what about resources that you can look at satellite maps or, or, um, anything like that, that you use different apps or different, um, mapping kind of things that you could get an idea of the lay of the land before you even go. I'm big on the maps. I spent, you can ask my girlfriend, I spent hours looking at Google. Um, Onyx, Onyx is a big one. You're going to, Onyx is probably the biggest app you're going to want to get. Um, I think it's 20 bucks a year. And what Onyx does is it's going to lay out all the property lines for you. So when you hunt a specific area, you can go on my FWC and they're, they're going to, they have these brochures. Well, the brochures that they give you are super vague. You can't tell property lines on there. And what Onyx will do is it'll paint you a beautiful picture. Um, you can track yourself, you can pin things. Um, so Onyx is a number one app that I recommend for that. Um, but other than that, for, as far as figuring out an area, I'll, I'll have Google, I'll have Bing and I'll have the Apple, you know, whatever the maps that comes with your iPhone already. And all three of those will have different layouts and they'll all kind of show you a different, different thing. You know, cypress trees will look different here. Um, a, a pineapple or a palmetto flat will look different here. And I'll use a combination of all three of those apps. And you can literally pin, I mean, think about it, 15 years ago, you couldn't do that. So there's a lot of new ground out there that are people are exploring. I mean, 10 years ago, you weren't walking three miles in the woods because you would, you would have died. You would have never found your way out. Never. Um, so definitely when you find an area, you know, go back home, go on the aerial view and just look you know, to pay attention to what cypress trees look like on a map, pay attention to what a pine tree looks like on a map. Um, for me, my, my secret is cypress. Bucks around South Florida love cypress. That's cover for them. It's the nastiest part of the woods there is. Um, and that's where the bucks are going to be. The harder it is to get to an area, the more likely there's going to be deer there. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Google maps is probably my favorite. That gives you the, the best layout of them all. And so I'll use Google with a combination of Onyx and that's pretty much how I find my way around. Nice. And then, um, for people that are, are getting started or, or refining their approach, uh, do you have videos that you're putting out or there, is there another place where people can go to watch some videos and, and kind of learn like that? Yeah, absolutely. YouTube. Um, I, pr I particularly don't do it too much. I've never been a big guy on, on doing my videos on YouTube, just cause I kind of keep it a little on the DL, but there's tons of people on YouTube who are public land hunters and they are showing you what you need to do, how to do it, all the mistakes they're making. Um, there's a couple big ones. I think, um, the public society or, or something, I can't remember, but the you, you can find public. it really easy on YouTube. Just yeah, the hunt. Yeah. Yeah. That's one. They do a great job. Um, not so much in Florida. They're not really in Florida too much. Um, uh, but any questions, you know, I, people message me all the time and I'm glad to help okay. any questions you have. I, um, I love, I love helping new hunters. A lot of my buddies now that I have who never hunted are huge, huge hunters. You know, my girlfriend, she never hunted a day in her life and she's probably one of the biggest bow hunters I know now. Um, so I love getting new hunters involved. It's kind of a big deal. You know, hunting is, it's a very touchy subject for a lot of people, but um, you know, if, like I said, if you're not born into it or you've never done it, a lot of people are kind of look against hunting. They don't like it, but I, I can tell you right now, the first time you go hunting, you'll be hooked. It's not about always killing it. For example, you know, like my, my trip in Colorado, I was up there for seven days hunting elk. Don't get me wrong. I would have loved to kill one, but just being out there in the mountains, meeting new people, some of the guides out there was more than I could have asked for. Right. It was soul cleansing. Right. So well, that's awesome. Hunting's great. Well, let's, uh, let's end right there. And why don't you tell people how they can get in touch with you, how they could message you, how they could follow you on social media, wherever you want to send them. Yeah. Uh, biggest is Instagram. I'm big on Instagram. That's Ryan Nitz, R Y A N N I T Z. 
Um, you can email me Ryan Nitz photography at gmail.com. Those are my two bait. I check those every day. Um, and that's pretty much it. I try and keep it just to that. Keep it simple. Right on. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for all that information. That's fantastic. And, uh, guys, he, he put it out there. If you have questions, you can, you can, uh, send him an email. He's a, he's a very, an email. Easy, very easy guy to talk to and, and you'll get a lot of information out of there. And when you go and follow him on his, uh, is Instagram. Don't be surprised if all of a sudden you want to go fishing for giant snook because <laughs> he's pretty good at that too. All right. So that's, that's uh how to Tuesday for today, how to hunt public land in Florida. And uh, I don't know about you, but I learned a ton. If you like this, share it with one of your friends, uh, tag us on Instagram, Tom underscore Roland underscore podcast, tag Ryan Nitz too. Let him know that you listened to this and that you liked what he had to say and Follow him on Instagram. He's got a great page. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you next week.